All right, friends, so today we are reading chapters 21 and 22 of Where the Mountain Meets the Sea. So let's see what happens next in Minley's journey. Minley and the Buffalo Boy pushed through the crowd as the sun burned the tops of their heads. Minley used to used to the Minley, used to the spare harvests of her village, couldn't help gaping at the tall mounds of food for the sa for sale at the market of green abundance. The street and open courtyard were filled with umbrella-covered stands and stalls, flaunting jade-colored cabbages, curled cucumbers, purple eggplants, and tangy oranges. Glossy, sugared hawthorn berries, like rubies on a stick, made Minley's mouth water. I don't see the kink anywhere, Minley said. Well, maybe he's not here yet, the buffalo boy said. I don't know if I'll find him here, Minley said. Now in the daylight, the buffalo boy's friend didn't seem as extraordinary. What would the king be doing at a street market anyway? She said he'd be here, so he will, the buffalo boy said, his mouth making a stubborn line. Hey, get away from that! A vendor yelled as the buffalo attempted to eat a frosty green lettuce. The buffalo boy quickly pulled him away. Get your buffalo out of here, the vendor shouted, as red-faced as the radishes he was selling. I better take him away, the buffalo boy said, pulling the buffalo's head away from the arrays of tempting food. He's hungry. I should take him to pasture. I'll stay here, Minley said. You don't need to look for the king with me. Okay, the boy said. If you need a place to stay tonight, you know where my hut is. If not, maybe I'll see you around. Good luck. Thanks, Minley said. But as he carelessly waved goodbye, she realized that she might not see him again. Before he disappeared from sight, she grabbed the last of the coin out of her bag and ran to him. Wait, Minley said. Here, take this. No, the boy laughed. I don't need that. You keep it. But Minley started, but he had already turned around. Goodbye, she heard him call, and the buffalo snorted a farewell as well. Minley smiled wryly to herself. Now what? Minley thought as she wandered past the stalls, weaving around merchants and customers. How am I supposed to find the king here? Please spare a piece of fruit for an old man, a voice creaked. Minley turned around and saw a wrinkled poor man begging at a peach stand. He was dirty and bent, and his clothes looked as if they were made from rags used to wash floors. Please, he begged the peach vendor. I'm so thirsty. One small peach, your smallest. Go away, old man, the fat vendor said. No money, no peach. Please, the beggar said again, weakly. Hitty a tired old man. Get away from here, you worthless beggar, the vendor sped out, or I'll call the guards on you. The vendor's loud voice had attracted attention from the passerby, and a small crowd began to form in front of the peach stand. It's disgraceful to treat an old man like that, someone murmured. Just give him a peach. All of you are so generous with my property, the vendor glared at the crowd. If you care so much, buy him a peach. As Min Lee watched the beggar's hands outstretched and shaking with hunger, she felt a sharp pang inside her. It reminded her of Ba reaching out with his last chopstick full of rice for her fish. The copper coin she had offered to the buffalo boar boy was warm in her hand. She could almost feel her heart beating against its round edges. Here, she said, handing the vendor the coin. Then she picked the largest peach on the stand and handed it to the old man. He bowed to her gratefully and eagerly ate the peach. Forgetting about the inner city and the palace for the moment, Min Lee watched him. In fact, as if under a spell, the whole crowd stood and watched him swallow the fruit until he held the peach pit in his hand. Thank you, the beggar said in a much stronger voice. And he bowed to the onlooking people. The peach was so delicious. I wish for all of you to be able to taste it. If you would humor an old man and stay a while, I'll share my good fortune. The old man took a small stick out of his pocket and bent down. In the dirt next to the black bricks, he dug a small hole and planted his peach pit. He stuck his stick upright in the little mound and then asked for water. Min Lee, now completely fascinated, took out her water jug and handed it to him. As he poured water onto his stick, it trembled. And was she imagining it? It seemed to grow. And it was growing. 
The stick grew higher and higher and thicker and thicker until it was the width of Min Lee's arm. When she could no longer see the top of it, pink flowers and branches began to blossom out of it. As the sweet scent of flowers filled the air, Min Lee realized the stick had become a peach tree. The crowd of people seemed to realize this too as they all gaped at it open-mouthed. Even the stingy vendor left his fruit stand to stare at it in awe. Like pink snow, the petals fell from the tree and made a soft carpet on the dirt. Green leaves sprouted, and as they cascaded over the branches, pale moon-colored balls like pearls developed. Almost as if they were small balloons being blown with air, they grew into round fruit, blushing pink and red as they developed. Soon the tree was heavy with them, and the air was full of enchanting smell of ripe peaches. Children gathered around and stared longingly at the luscious fruit, while the adults gulped with their mouths watering. Finally, the old man reached up, plucked a peach from the tree, and handed it to one of the people in the crowd. Please, he said, waving his hand, help yourself. The crowd needed no urging. Young children climbed the tree and passed the fruit down, while the taller adults simply stretched and grabbed. A boy with a tired horse climbed onto its back to reach an especially red peach that called him. Before long, everyone's mouths were full of soft, sweet peach flesh and groans of delight. Even the peach vendor, his stand forgotten, stood under the tree with his eyes closed contentedly and the peach juice dribbling out of his mouth. Min Lee, however, didn't join in the feast of peaches. If I hadn't been eating peaches all the way to the city, Min Lee said to herself, I'd be the first one climbing the tree. But as she was slightly tired of peaches, Min Lee saw that no one else did. She noticed that every time someone plucked a peach from the tree, a peach from the fruit stand disappeared. The beggar is using the, the vendor's peaches for his tree, Min Lee laughed to herself as she glanced at him through the fruit-eating crowd. He was watching with an amused look, and suddenly Min Lee saw that the beggar wasn't really old at all. He must be a magician. Maybe he can help me get into the inner city. Min Lee edged toward him. As she weaved her way to him, the last peach was picked from the tree, and the leaves and branches began to disappear. The trunk seemed to shrivel into itself and grew thinner and shorter. The crowd had finished their peaches, and, and the ground was littered with peach pits. When Min Lee finally reached the beggar, the tiny twig of the tree vanished underneath the pile of peach pits, and the beggar was turning to leave. Wait, Min Lee said, and grabbed his arm. However, as Min Lee took hold of his sleeve, it pulled back, and a glint of gold shone. Hastily, the beggar pushed back his sleeve, but the quick glance was enough for Min Lee to see that he wore a gold bracelet in the shape of a dragon. They stared at each other as Min Lee's quick-thinking mind somersaulted. Only the imperial family is allowed to use the image of a dragon, Dragon had said. Everyone knows a golden dragon is always and only worn by kings, the buffalo boy said. The words flashed in her mind, and Min Lee could scarcely breathe. You're wearing a dragon, Min Lee gasped. Only the... is allowed to wear a golden dragon. You must be... you must be... Where's that beggar? A loud, angry voice. A loud, angry shout cut through the chaos. Min Lee recognized the vendor's voice. He stole my peaches. I'll get him. Quickly, the beggar shook off, shook off Min Lee from his arm and began to run. She stared in shock as she finished her sentence. You must be, Min Lee whispered to the ragged, disappearing figure, the king. All right, chapter 22. We're getting close, friends. Min Lee shook herself from shock. The king, Min Lee said, I can't lose him now. And in panic, she began to run after the tattered figure. And it was quite a chase, and it wouldn't have been if the beggar had realized he was being followed. He wove in and out around people and bins of rice, each step taking them closer to the unused areas of the city. Behind a pile of discarded baskets, Min Lee thought she had lost him, but luckily the gray sleeve of his loose jacket waved at her, and she saw him round the walled corner of the inner city. As an abandoned wagon hid, hid her from his view, she saw him push against a portion of the wall. With a slow groan, the wall moved. 
It's a secret door to the inner city, Min Lee gasped, and she was able to reach it just before it closed completely. With both hands, she pressed hard against it, and the door pushed open. And like a lid of a jewelry box, the door opened into a landscape of radiant colors. The bamboo, pine, and plum leaves seemed to shine in the sun as if carved from emeralds, and the accents of the pink and red flowers were like nestled rubies. Steps away from her feet, Min Lee could see a patterned pathway made of water-worn pebbles. The central jade green lake mirrored the arching tiled, tiled roof of the pavilion and the rough beauty of large weathered rock sculptures. A winding covered walkway lifted from the cloudy water like a lotus flower. It could only be the palace garden. But Min Lee barely noticed this. Instead, she stood with large eyes staring at the figure in front of her. The beggar was wiping his face with a delicate white cloth, and Min Lee saw again that he was not an old man at all. In fact, he was younger than Ba. The gray of his hair was wiped away with the cloth as well, and his beard in his beard and head were glossy black as Min Lee's. His gray rags had been cast off in a pile next to him, and he was clothed in a bright yellow silk the color of the sun. Intricate dragons and multicolored clouds that matched the design of the gold bracelet he wore were embroidered on his robes and glittered in the light. There was no doubt now that he was the king. Then the king turned around and saw her. At his glance, Min Lee shrank to the ground in a humble kowtow. Your majesty, Min Lee breathed, and her knees could feel the thumping of her heart in her chest. Caught, Min Lee heard him say, and she peeked up to see the king looking at her with the same amused expression he'd had as a beggar watching the people eat the peaches. He shook his head at her. With his eyes twinkling at her, he could have been the young father of one of her village friends. And by you, he said, my little benefactor, I knew you were a clever one. Your majesty, your majesty, a chorus of voices came through the air toward them and Min Lee could see a parade of servants in the distance running across the zigzagged bridge. Well, you mustn't be caught by them, the king said to Min Lee, and then they would find out all about my little adventures, and then where will I be? And he pulled Min Lee up to her feet, pushed her behind one of the giant gnarled stone carvings, kicking his rags over to her. Quickly, quickly, he said, and don't say a word. I command you to not say a word or to come out until I say so. Min Lee clutched the rough stone and made herself as small as possible. Hundreds of footsteps were approaching like falling rain from a thunderstorm. What is this? the king demanded. Has war been declared on the city? Your majesty, an out of breath voice said, we have been searching for you. Searching for me? the king said. I have been here in the garden for hours. We, we must have missed you, the voice stuttered. None could find you. The guards had not seen you, and we feared. You feared the king of the city of bright moonlight had been spirited away, the king laughed. Not this time, Counselor Chu. However, I do feel the wish to commune with the moon tonight. Your majesty, the voice said. Yes, the king said decisively. Tonight, I wish to be alone in the garden with the moon. Have a meal brought to me in the clasping the moon pavilion, and do not disturb me until morning. Yes, your majesty, the voice said, and Min Lee couldn't help but peek out. She saw rows and rows of finely dressed people kneeling with their heads on the ground in front of the king. One man, dressed in black, kneeled closer to the king, separate from the rest of the courtiers. Min Lee guessed he was Counselor Chu. Actually, bring me two meals, the king said, and glanced toward Min Lee. She caught his eye and quickly shrank back out of sight. Two meals, your majesty? Counselor Chu asked, with the faintest question in his voice. Yes, two meals, the king said. I shall honor the spirit of the moon with her own meal, since she will be keeping me company. It is only fair. Yes, your majesty, the counselor said. Min Lee could only guess how puzzled he was, but he was well trained enough to keep it out of his voice. In an hour's time, the king said, I shall be at the clasping the moon pavilion. I want the food waiting for me and nothing else. I do not wish to be disturbed by anyone this evening. Yes, your majesty, the voice said again, 
and Min Lee could hear the shuffling and swishing of silk as the group rose to leave the king. They've gone, the king said in a low voice. You can come out now. Min Lee crawled out from behind the sculpture. Well, my little friend, he said to her, now that you know who I am, come walk with me and tell me who you are. All right, so that is the end of chapters 21 and 22. I want you guys to think about all of those adjectives, all of that descriptive language we just heard in these chapters. Think about the way that our author described the palace garden, all of those different colors. If you closed your eyes while you listened to me read, it's almost like you could picture yourself there. So I want you guys to write a story. It can be a real story, it can be something you make up, but I just want it to be full of details. I want it to be like, whoever is reading it can be right there with you. There's so many adjectives. That is what I want you guys to practice today. And come back and we'll read some more of our book.